Hello, and welcome to episode 3.5, the November 8th, 2023 Veterans Edition of Notes from the Isle Seat, the podcast that covers the arts in Northern Chautauqua County, sponsored by the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. My name is Tom Lachlan, and I'm your host as we bring you news and information about arts events at the Opera House and around the region, including interviews with artists and creators across the county. On behalf of the 1891 Fredonia Opera House, I'd like to wish all veterans out there a happy Veterans Day and thank you for your service. But for me personally, a simple thank you is not nearly enough. My last college roommate was a Vietnam veteran, and throughout his life he struggled to keep things together. When he died, he was living in a substandard housing complex in an 8x10 dormitory room where he wasted away, unable to get proper medical attention. He deserved better. With so many veterans homeless, mentally and emotionally struggling, and taking their own lives, I hope this Veterans Day that our nation will work harder towards making sure that every veteran receives the help and care they need to live fruitful and fulfilling lives. The town of Pomfret historian Mr. Todd Langworthy will be giving a fitting lecture as part of the Chautauqua History Series at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on the Veterans of Pomfret's Past on Thursday, November 9th at 7 p.m., one day after this podcast is released. I spoke with Todd about his work as town of Pomfret historian and about his upcoming lecture. I'm joined now by Mr. Todd Langworthy, and uh, Todd is a, in his, in his real life, he's a retired social studies teacher from Forestville High School, although he now has a bunch of history classes to teach at SUNY Fredonia JCC, so he hasn't really retired, uh, but he's also been the town of Pomfret historian since 2005, and he will be giving a lecture at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Veterans of Pomfret's Past, and that's Thursday, November 9th at 7 p.m. So, Todd, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate being on with you. Now, um, in talking to you before I actually started the interview, I was um, I, I learned that you are one of the inspirations for this uh, lecture series. Uh, can you talk about how you got it all started? Yeah, it, it's it's been at least probably five years. Uh, uh, I'm sure Rick could tell you the exact you know time that we started, but um, Rick and I kind of put our heads together, and and uh, I thought it would be kind of a neat idea to try to share local history and. And uh, I used to help, uh, you know, in organizing it with Rick and, and lining up speakers and things. And and we worked together on it. And, and now kind of uh, as I've gotten busier, which doesn't seem to make sense that I've retired and I'm busier, but it seems to <laughs> seems to follow me. But um, but uh, Rick, Rick has, has kind of taken on the reins more. And and uh, we chat now and then about ideas and 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 things. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and sometimes I'm able to help, you know, a little bit and. I always am willing to do, you know, at least one program per year uh, in the series or, you know, more if needed. So, so basically Rick has kind of uh, continued on with, with everything with a little less of my help, but uh, he does, as anyone that knows Rick, Rick does a fantastic job with everything. And, and the opera house is by far my, my most favorite venue anywhere. Um, It's like a second home. I love it there. So I'm always willing to to take part in this program. um, Always. That's great because I think the program has been very, very uh, well received around uh, the region for sure. Um, yeah. I'm amazed sometimes when Rick tells me, uh, you know, oh, we had all these people here, like, you know, a, a, a good crowd. So uh, people yes. enjoy coming yeah. and l- l- learning about local history. Yeah, it's been great. You know, I think the programming has been, you know, excellent. Um, we've always, you know, when we started with Rick and I and uh, Rick has always, you know, tried to do, you know, a variety of different programs that people would like. And um uh, you know, and we have such great resources locally and our uh, people that are able to present. I think that helps a lot, too. So you have been the town of Pomfret historian since 2005. How does somebody get a job like that? Um, well, um, I remember when I was when I was interviewed for the job, we'd actually in the last couple of years had just moved into the town of Pomfret. Um, we'd lived in the town of Sheridan where I was raised. And uh, we bought a house in in, uh, in uh, Fredonia on Johnson Street, which is in the town. Um and I don't live in the village. I live on the opposite side of the street, which is just in the town. So um, they had they had kind of posted for this job, and it was it was something I'd never really thought about. Um, yeah, I was a history teacher at that point already, and it was like, all right, well, that might be interesting. So I just went to the interview and thought, well, we'll see how it goes. And Don Steger was uh, the uh, supervisor at that time, 
And I remember going in and meeting with the town board and Don, and there was a few other applicants and kind of went in and, and I kind of told them, I think I told them as much what I wasn't going to do as far as what I would do, um, which is kind of odd for an interview. I'm just brutally honest. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hide like in an office and just do research and not ever talk to anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, going to gather artifacts and have boxes and boxes of artifacts. We have a museum in town. It's, it's for that purpose. And, you know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to speak in a community. I'm going to put on programs and, and, and things in the public. I'm going to go into schools and things like that. And, and, and talk with students because I'm a teacher. I go, that's what I'm going to do. And 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 if you think that would be your vision for what you would like the position to be, I, I said, you know, I I would I would very much you know love to hear about it. And and if that's not what you would want, I said, you know, I'm I'm fine with that. I hope I didn't waste your time. And God bless her soul, Pat Christina, former um, board member in the town. Pat, uh, I so I I thanked everyone and left and uh, left. I got out the door and I got about twenty yards from the door and and Pat ran out and she said, stop. And I'm like, turned around. Like I thought that, like I'd forgotten something. I'm like, I go, Oh, okay. Was there something wrong? She's no, I, I, I didn't want you to leave. Like, she's like, we want you. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I didn't even hardly get down the sidewalk. And I'm like, Oh, okay. She, she was like, she's like, you had us from your first paragraph. <laughs> that's what we want. And I've been there ever since. Um, that's a, that's a wonderful story. It's great. Yeah, you know? it, it's fun. It, it's funny how that happened, but, uh, but yeah, I've been at it, you know, almost 20 years now and, uh, it doesn't seem like that long, but, uh, yeah, it's been almost 20 years. So now let's talk a little bit about what's coming up here. Um, on Thursday, November 9th, you're going to give a talk about veterans at uh, Pomfret's past, which uh, is uh, very appropriate. Uh, the fact that November 11th is Veterans Day, and and we have noticed uh, both in Dunkirk and in Fredonia um, the big push to get banners of veterans up on the lampposts and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. lining many of the streets in the area. So this is a pretty um, pretty timely presentation you you've uh, developed. Yeah, when we were kind of looking at the dates, you know, many months ago, and uh, uh, and, and speaking with Rick. Um, trying to figure out what would fit where, um, you know, for the fall, you know, I kind of looked at either October or November and, um, you know, I thought with November, it was going to be like our last, last one um, for the year, more or less. And I thought about November and like, what would be good? I'm like, well, obviously it's Veterans Day. And I thought, well, maybe do something about local veterans. Um, it's not going to be a like a timeline or anything like that of just, you know, listing a bunch of names or you know, I'm, I'm going to try to give a little bit of the story of some local veterans going way back to the beginning. Um, you know, going back to, you know, the last 200 plus years uh, of local residents and try to talk about a few of them. I, I don't have enough time to do, you know, all of them, of course, but I mean, I've, I've kind of handpicked a few here and there to kind of give a variety and keep people's interests. And I've, I've got a I've got a couple surprises that I think people will like, and uh, you know I think uh, there'll be some of the uh, people that I talk about that I think will be recognizable in the sense that um, when I mention the name and I bring maybe the picture up, people will be like, "Oh, I've heard of him before," or something like that. But they they might not equate them with being a veteran, and that was kind of one of my goals was that you know some of these important figures from our past um that were veterans you know that i would share you know a little bit of their story about their life and who they were you know and if people didn't know who they were um and their exploits you know outside of their military service they would know that and maybe learn a little about that but then they would also learn that they were a veteran um you know and i thought with with veterans day being in november that would be a great program and people would like that and so so that's kind of, kind of what steered me into this so this is a brand new program i haven't done it anywhere else and probably will not do anywhere else so um, it'll be a it'll be a one time shot so but i do some of those but i have other ones that i do you know different people ask for um i do a lot um actually with uh alonzo cushing of course um he will i uh, i'll admit he's going to be in this program um Okay. He has to be. He has to, he be, has yes. to be. He's my alter ego. I can't not include uh, Alonzo um, because I do living history presentations as Alonzo and have been going out portraying Alonzo for 15 years. And, um, you know, obviously he'll be a, he'll be a part of the program, but I'm, I'm not going to like go off on the Alonzo uh, branch too far because that would be I could I could do a two hour lecture just on him. 
just and what I know about him and you know playing him as many times as I have I was trying to count and it's I'm up to like over 75 appearances as Alonzo so wow getting up there yeah I appear at schools and things as him and uh quite often it's it's around Veterans Day sometimes that I get asked to do that so yeah I was just at Westfield um a few weeks ago um Westfield Middle School did a presentation there as Alonzo and um, for their Gettysburg uh, Day, so for the Civil War, so it's always nice to you know to to bring attention to veterans. I think my dad is a veteran, is in the United States Army. Um, so I mean, you know, I think that you know any attention we can bring to our veterans is is wonderful. And I thought some of the veterans of our town's past would be a great topic. So that's kind of where it all comes from. So I think it's an excellent topic, and I know I'm walking a thin line because it's very. Whenever I'm doing one of these uh, uh, lecture presentations, it's very difficult to talk to the person who's doing the presentation and ask them for a little insight without having them give away what they would do right. at the presentation, you know? Yeah, I have a little note here next to me going, don't tell too much as a little reminder. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> well, a good show. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty wise uh, a, a, a pretty wise choice. <laughs> what do you so let me ask you this question then. Um just to sort of uh, uh, talk about it as a side note. Um, I, I've noticed in the past and even I myself have a uh, uh, many years ago did a um, presentation on a, a Civil War veteran, not from this area, but a Civil War veteran from Vermont, from the 10th Vermont in the Civil War, who wrote many, many letters home. And I, we found his letters and I created a, a one person show based on his particular letters called A Better Band Than Mine. And I'm interested to in your take as an historian on this um sort of the, this rising interest in uh, 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 veterans, particularly uh, the Civil War. Has, has, is that a yeah. new phenomenon, or do you think that's been around for uh, just a long time and we haven't noticed it? Yeah, I think it's been around. I think that, you know, the Civil War is extremely popular, I think, because um, you know, it, it's so unique. And it, it was, you know, in, in, in many cases, it was literally brother fighting against brother. Um, family member fighting against family member. Um, it, it, it's a unique experience in our history, um, a tragic experience, but I think many people's interest in it is because so many of the things, you know, happen that are close to home that, that you, you know, that you can understand, um, you know, and if for people that live further south, of course, you know, they live near battlefields where things actually happen. Um, you know, for us, not so much in that sense, but I mean, there are so many veterans from the Civil War from our area. Um, you know, that I think most families have some sort of a connection uh, to that. Um, and of course, you know, when you look at the fatalities, I mean, more uh, more Americans died in the uh, the Civil War than, than all other wars combined, um, which a lot of people, you know, even my students in my college classes, they're like, Professor, are you sure about that? Are you sure about your numbers? I go, oh, yeah, it's not really even that close. Yeah. And they think about it, they go, oh, well, it makes sense because both sides were Americans. And and the carnage, of course, was unbelievable because it was, you know, that time when technology, you know, had, had started to surpass uh, tactics that were used that were outdated and it led to, you know, horrible um, casualty numbers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the Civil War really has kind of a special place in Americans' minds just because of the uniqueness of that experience and just how it, you know, it touches so many people personally. And and uh, I think the last thing I'll ask you is, um, but speaking of connections, um, most people who fought in World War II, the greatest generation, are now in their 90s and above, and we're, yeah. we're beginning to lose most of them. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, you probably have a couple of World War II vets in your uh, presentation, um, but yeah. you know the the fact that we're losing those stories, how important is it to to make sure that we grab every single story that we can at this point from from the people who uh, fought in world war ii yeah I, I you know i i think that's one thing that that many people forget is that you know that generation you know they're 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 not going to be around much longer there's very few of them around and you lose that that personal connection you know when you can't sit you know like we're sitting and talking now and you can't sit and talk to someone that was actually there you know, it, you lose a lot. It's such a great resource to have these vets still around, at least a few of them, that, you know, that, that's going to be a terrible loss when they're all gone. So, yeah, to, to be able to, to you know, gain more information from those that are still around is, is, is a real treasure. And I think that, 
you know, it's going to be sad when, when most all of them are gone because, you know, that, that won't be much longer. And, you know, my father, who is a, a veteran of the uh, United States Army, you know, he was of the, of the Korean era. Um, he served in the early 50s, was stationed in um, uh, Germany um, in the years after World War II and the occupying forces there. And he was there, you know, like I said, in the early 50s, 51, 52, 53, in that range. Um, and my dad's 91. Um, so, I mean, you know, even those Korean vets, you know, they aren't going to be around much longer either, you know, and then it just goes to the next conflict and then we'll get into some of the Vietnam vets won't be around much anymore. And it's just a shame to lose that resource. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I think the uh, audiences are going to really have a, a, a tremendous uh, experience listening to you talking about uh, the veterans of uh, Pomfret's past for sure. Um, it's an interesting topic. And I think that uh, uh, I congratulate you for keeping it alive, um, keeping the spirits of the veterans alive and making sure we all honor that heritage. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity very much to speak with you and uh, looking forward to Presenting at my second home, the Opera House, it's, it's like it's like presenting in my living room. It really is. I just think that much of it. So, that's great, Todd. Great. Thank you very much for uh, coming on the podcast, and uh, you know we'll look forward to your presentation at the Opera House for sure. Great. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Veterans of Pomfret's Past will be presented Thursday, November 9th, twenty twenty-three, at seven p.m. Admission is free. Donations are gratefully accepted. If anyone can be said to be a veteran of the Appalachian Roots music scene, it's Kathy Fink. Along with her musical partner, Marcy Markser, she will be presenting a unique blend of a musical workshop and concert featuring Chinese Tonkin musician Chao Tian. The presentation is called From China to Appalachia. Kathy explains it quite well, as you'll hear in this discussion of her work. Well, I'm quite pleased now to be joined by Kathy Fink. She is part of the uh, Kathy Fink, uh, Marcy Markser, and I believe it's pronounced Chao Tian. Chao uh, Tian. Chao Tian. Chao Tian Trio. That's going to be coming to the uh, 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Sunday, November 12th at 7 p.m. And they'll be doing a, a presentation called From China to Appalachia. So, Kathy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, let's start off just a little bit with uh, the, uh, the the background in terms of the kind of music you're interested in, the kind of music you play. Uh, what uh, I know you play roots music, American roots music, a lot of bluegrass and country swing and things like that. But where did you get that interest from? Let's start from there. Well, the interest in um, in what I'm going to call traditional based Appalachian music really goes back for Marcy and I. 50 years um, wow. as as members of the folk scene. And for me, I was, you know, 50 years ago, I was 20. I was living in Montreal. There was a big folk scene going on. There were five or six coffee houses. There were a lot of people playing. And, and one of the great things is that everybody had kind of discovered folk music at the same time. So one cool thing about that is you know, whoever just learned how to play freight train, freight train going so fast wanted to teach it to the next person. You know how excited you get when you learn this music. And so we not only had sort of a lot of great music around us, a lot of what I'm going to call source musicians coming up to perform in the area that we would get to see in here at the Yellow Door Coffee House and at some of the other coffee houses. But then this very generous group of musicians who just you know, we were all, I'm going to say eating from the same plate. We were all so excited about this music, so excited about buying recordings, so excited about listening to more and learning how it was done. And it was a different time because it was pretty much all done by ear back then. You know, we didn't have tabs. We didn't have YouTubes. We didn't have somebody online saying, here's where you put your fingers. You sat there and watched people and absorbed. And if you were lucky, you got them to sit down with you and 
help you out, etc. But that was where my love of Appalachian music came from, including some of it came from contemporary, um, what we would have called folk music back then. Mm -hmm. And that included uh, the music of Joni Mitchell, who, amongst other things, composed and sang some on the Appalachian dulcimer. Well, that made me curious. I loved her music. Well, along comes Richard and Mimi Farina. And Richard Farina was a monster on the dulcimer, and particularly in composing what I would say were very new, out-of-the-box tunes using a traditional instrument. And so all the seeds were planted there, and I decided I needed to have a dulcimer. And once I got my dulcimer, I wanted to hear all of the music I could find on it. I played a lap dulcimer, Appalachian dulcimer. Well, that introduced me to Gene Ritchie. It introduced me to Paul Clayton. It introduced me to this wide world of traditional music that I became very absorbed in. Now, at the same time, Marcy was in Michigan, and she grew up playing old-time music with her family. Her grandmother played the hammer dulcimer. There are some great stories about Marcy sitting on her grandmother's lap, holding on to the hammers with her grandma while her grandma played along. Her grandma played square dances for Henry Ford. Um, there was a lot of singing in the family. And eventually Marcy also took up guitar and bluegrass. And um, we didn't collide until 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, I was playing a folk festival in Toronto. It was uh, the first festival to take the place of the Mariposa Festival. They had taken a rest from Mariposa. Okay. And Marcy was playing in an all-girl string band called the Bosom Buddies String Band from Lansing, Michigan. And we ended up being in a few workshops together, having a great time. I did some touring with her band. They did some touring with us. Marcy and I did some playing together. And that got completely out of hand to the point where we realized that musically, the thing that we had the most fun in was playing music together. And that was early 80s. You know, move forward, we've played so many different kinds of music, but the centerpiece is, is generally some form of American roots music. At the same time, with a wide interest in what I'll loosely call world music. Well, almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago, I became involved in a program called the Artist in Residence Program at a performing arts center in North Bethesda, Maryland called the Music Center at Strathmore. And Strathmore did something totally unique and out of the box. They started this Artist in Residence Program for the purpose of taking six up and coming artists between the ages of 16 and 32 and giving them a year of business workshops, artistic mentoring, performance opportunities, networking opportunities. So about six years ago, one of our artists was Chow Tien. Enter a classically trained Chinese hammered dulcimer player. The instrument in Chinese is called Yang Tin. She is an amazing musician. And she had literally all her life only played classical Chinese music. And it was mind-blowingly beautiful. And the Chinese hammer dulcimer looks a lot like the American hammer dulcimer, but it is tuned differently, it's set up differently. And throughout the course of that mentorship, we became friends. And Chow was new to the US. She hadn't performed a lot here. She was a little, I'll say, hesitant about introducing her songs in English and all of that. And so we just started doing some concerts together so she would be able to imbibe how it's done. You know, instead of somebody sitting there saying, here's what you do, let's just go out and do this together. And it was super fun. She toured a bunch with Marcy and myself and our friend Sam Gleaves, uh, who's a great old time Appalachian musician and songwriter. And more importantly, we started jamming and jamming with lots of different people. We jammed with jazz musicians. We jammed with, you know, Latin musicians. We jammed with old time music and she loves old time music. And one of the discoveries along the line is even though Chow had spent her life reading music, Chinese classical music, she had throughout the whole time developed a really, really good ear. She can play by ear. A lot of classical musicians 
don't find that so easy to do. And she just developed this incredible love of old time Appalachian music. And we started doing some shows together and they, they just glued themselves together so beautifully where, um, we play Appalachian music. We play some Chinese. Now she's got to adapt her playing to what we do with Clawhammer banjo, guitar, mandolin, Marcy playing the cello banjo. But then now we've incorporated Chinese melodies and they are really hard to learn on American old time instruments, but a beautiful challenge and a beautiful sound. And the more that we work together, I would say every time we get together, we have more and more ideas on how we can um, talk about the differences and the overlaps in the kinds of music that we make. By example, one of my favorite pieces that Chow brought to the table was something that Pete Seeger recorded. Pete recorded um, the three rules of discipline and the eight points of attention. And when, um, when the Red Army was, was defecting to Mao Zedong, you had armies full of peasants who were illiterate and they actually had rules of discipline and engagement for how to treat civilians properly during wartime. Mm -hmm. Nothing is more relevant <laughs> in our world right now than this concept, right? But this goes back so far in history and the recording that Chow found was, um, I think around 1975, Pete and Arlo Guthrie. And so we've adapted this instrumentally to include the Chinese hammer dulcimer, banjo and guitar. And then in both English and Chinese, we speak what, what the rules and, and the disciplines are. And, you know, I'm not sure how we could make anything else come more for full circle. I mean, if there's anyone that brought the banjo forward from the American South in a way that spoke to so many people, it was Pete. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he wrote one of the first books on all these eclectic styles of playing banjo, etc. And then there he was singing and playing a Chinese melody, a Chinese song that today still holds great relevance. Um, those intercultural moments are really interesting. We're, we're so aware of our roles in cultural diplomacy that this is people to people stuff and um and the importance of it is is not just the music but the meaning behind the music and the humanity behind the music and we have so much fun and that's the thing you know there's there's a lot of improvisation in what we do uh, we're comfortable enough with each other to say, okay, here's the outline of the arrangement, and then whatever happens, happens. Yeah, it really is. I mean, uh, the the vast variety of instruments that you and, and uh, Marcy use, uh, then throw in the hammer dulcimer, it, it really is just, I just, I, I, I laughed, and I found it interesting and, and different and so much fun, just so much fun. You know, I think that's one of the centerpieces, even when we're playing something serious, we have to find it fun. We have to find it interesting. And that's what's gonna make it fun and interesting for you. And also, you know, as you mentioned, these combinations of instruments, the idea that we're playing things with a four string cello banjo, a five string banjo, and a Chinese hammer dulcimer, or Marcy playing Django Reinhardt on the ukulele and me playing jazz rhythm guitar and Chow on the hammer dulcimer. Or um, take it a step further. And this is, this is where I'll say, from our point of view, sort of honoring tradition and taking it somewhere else. Marcy and I are huge fans of and have done a lot of research in the history of women in old time music. And in fact, there's an exhibit at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum going on right now that I was one of, uh, on the team that created this whole exhibit. And uh, there was a woman named Cousin Emmy, Cynthia May Carver. And uh, those of you who are Pete Seeger fans, you can go see Cousin Emmy online on YouTube on Pete's Rainbow Quest show. And she's standing there with her bouffant hairdo, her high heels <laughs> and her five string banjo, 
whooping and hollering, but the best part is when Cousin Emmy pulls out the rubber glove and plays a song on a rubber glove. I can see from your eyes that that's the next thing you're gonna go to on YouTube. Well, Cousin Emmy recorded a song that the melody is a traditional Appalachian melody called Reuben's Train. Oh, Reuben had a train and he put it on the track. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. She created new lyrics. Oh, Ruby, Ruby, honey, are you mad at your man? And eventually that song, as we would call it today, went viral, got famous when the Osborne brothers recorded it in a bluegrass style. Meantime, we perform it with me playing a fretless gourd banjo, Chow on the hammer dulcimer, and she's got some tricks up her sleeve there that I'm not even going to give away, and Marcy on the doombeck. Wow. You know, there's a combo that you wouldn't see everywhere. No. And so we're bringing in this Mideastern sound, this Chinese sound, this hardcore Appalachian sound, and a big vocal. Um, and a story about all the different places that we can combine the music from. Kathy, I, I think I could talk to you for another three hours. Um, I've only got so much time, and I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and, and bringing all the sounds. And, and I know that the audiences that come to the Opera House are going to hear something very, very unusual and very delightful. It's a pleasure. Thank you. From China to Appalachia is a day-long event with two parts. A community workshop will be given in Mason Hall, room 1080, on the SUNY Fredonia campus, beginning at 2 p.m. All members of the community are invited to attend this workshop. Participants are welcome to bring an instrument to the workshop. At 7 p.m. at the Opera House, the trio will give a concert. Tickets for the concert are $20 for adults, $18 for members, and $10 for students. You can get tickets for the concert by calling the box office at 716-679-1891 or online at www.fredopera.org backslash tickets. From China to Appalachia is part of the Folk and Fredonia Gilman Family Music Series and is made possible in part through the Mid-Atlantic Tours Program of Mid-Atlantic Arts with support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Here is the arts calendar for the next two weeks, November 8th through 21st. The Hillman Memorial Music Association, in cooperation with the Fredonia School of Music and the Department of Theater and Dance, will present the annual Hillman Opera on Friday, November 10th and Saturday, November 11th in King Concert Hall. Both performances begin at 7.30 p.m. This year's opera is Johann Strauss II's Die Fledermaus considered one of the great musical, comedic, and theatrical masterpieces of the Romantic period. Tickets are available at the campus box office by calling 716-673-3501 or online at www.fredonia.edu backslash tickets. The School of Music will also be presenting the following free events in the upcoming two weeks. Unless otherwise noted, all events are in the Roush Recital Hall and begin at 8 p.m. Fredonia Chambermaid Guitar will perform on Thursday, November 9th. The Flute and Bassoon Ensembles will perform on Sunday, November 12th, beginning at 5 p.m. The Fredonia Guitar Quartets and Ensemble will perform on Monday, November 13th. The Wind Symphony and Fredonia Sinfonia will perform on Tuesday, November 14th in King Concert Hall at 8 p.m. The Wind Ensemble will follow on Wednesday, November 15th in King Concert Hall at 8 p.m. And finally, the Fredonia Concert Band performs on Thursday, November 16th in King Concert Hall at 8 p.m. And remember, if you have an arts event coming up and would like to get it mentioned on the arts calendar, send an email to operahouse at fredopera.org or call the box office at 716-679-1891 with your information.
The next Live at the Met presentation will be a performance of X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, on Saturday, November 18th, 2023, at 1 p.m. I was incredibly fortunate to be able to discuss this significant work with opera veteran Mr. Tim Kennedy, the founder and artistic director emeritus of Buffalo Opera Unlimited. Here's that interview. Well, I cannot tell you what a thrill, uh, I mean, an absolute thrill it is to have uh, my next guest on the podcast. He is Mr. Uh, Tim Kennedy, and Tim was the uh, artistic director for the Buffalo Opera Unlimited organization in Buffalo. He was the artistic director for 37 years. He founded the company um, and uh, retired in September of 2022. And I had a chance to work with him doing a show just before his retirement. It was a great experience. Tim, I am so, so glad to have you on the podcast. Well, it's good to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, now, Tim and I are going to talk about the upcoming Live at the Met performance at the Fredonia Opera House on November 18th, 1 o'clock p.m. Uh, they're doing X, the life and times of Malcolm X. Uh, Anthony Davis, the composer, Christopher Davis uh, created the story, and Thelani Davis, a family effort, uh, created the libretto. And um, I know that uh, uh, Tim has uh, tremendous expertise in uh, uh, opera, um, as well as jazz and other forms of music. So uh, I'm going to let Tim sort of give us as much of an introduction as he can to this because um, it's great. But the first thing I'll ask you, Tim, just to get a perspective is um, we know that the Metropolitan Opera has been pivoting to uh, more uh, inclusion, diversity, and all of that, uh, um, all of those uh, issues that are coming on. They've done uh, uh, a fire shut up in my bones. They did champion. And now they're picking up this 1986 opera uh, that had its premiere at the New York city opera uh, in Lincoln center. Um, just, you know, briefly, what, how do you view this, uh, this, this pivot by the Met? Interesting. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I, I've been thinking about it and talking with my, my uh, opera opera friends and i really think it's it's let's face it the pandemic had such an incredible uh effect on on opera as far as con as as far as concerned there was this as far as opera is concerned and of course i think it, there's so many things that go through my head first of all I mean, the average opera goer is normally 60 years old. And you just take for granted that I had the company for 37 years. So you can imagine some changes have to come about. Certain things have to come about because well, the the, um, the average opera goer is aging out. And I think the sad thing about it, Tom, is that I wish we did a better job or musicians or schools, I think, did a better job of really including this whole concept of getting uh, the next generation ready to, to enjoy music. So, you know, we're at a point where we can only enjoy the, um, uh, the traditional things. And now we're going in another direction completely. We've got a new generation coming in. And what's most important, I'm finding out, is that they save the art form. Otherwise, uh, that's what they're afraid of. You know, Fire Shot With My Bones was like maybe fourth or fifth on the schedule. But right after the pandemic, they put it first. And that, I think, was to, to make sure that they could get an audience. And they did. They got the black audience and then they got the white and, and, and the white audience. And they made sure that they had people in seats. Mm -hmm. I think that it, you, you've got to have an audience to make this to this work in the art form. And I think that's what these administrators are going through right now. It's a kind of long way to answer your question. But um, and I think also there was a very important podcast that went on with a lot of the A line black singers. And they talked about a lot of discrimination and what was going on as opera singers that really made a dent. In, um, in what was going on during that time, right during the pandemic. And I think a lot of the opera companies were sensitive to it because these were great Black opera singers. And they talked about some of the uh, problems they had as far as racism, et cetera. 
And I think, you know, both the idea of wanting an audience, you know, finding out what was going on by some of the very famous Black singers at this time who are having careers. And I think they that had to be inclusive, plus the next generation. So. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tim. I really appreciate it. Um, so let's talk about um, X, the life and times of Malcolm X. Now, for you yeah. and I both, we are about the same age. And uh, yeah. both of us, of course... Um, were inspired by uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X when it first came out. Uh, you shared with me that just about every African-American male of that generation had to read it. Um, I was not required to read it, but it was actually part of my high school reading um, list, uh, uh, which um, most people find unusual because, you know, I went to a, a suburban Catholic boys high school. Oh, and, right. and and But one of the things that they that they did there was a lot of the stuff that they made us read had to do with spiritual journeys. And they were wise enough to know that the autobiography of Malcolm X was a spiritual journey. And so that's why they put it on our reading list, um, which which I, I never really realized until like, you know, 30 years later. Um, so so this man was a was a was a, a, a mover and a shaker in the 60s and an incredible uh, influence. Um, talk, can you talk about that a little from your point of view? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the best explanation for Malcolm X is that he was a tragic hero. I have mixed feelings about it because although he was a great orator and uh, he really um, he really com- embraced the concept of black separatism. And um, he was an anti-Semite. He has he, he said uh, remarks uh, against Jewish people. And but that was the beginning of a journey, speaking about spiritual journey for him. That's how he started. But he was so great at what he did. Um, This man, uh, he influenced. uh, uh, He was the second influential leader of the nation of Islam. And and the first one, of course, was Elijah Muhammad, who was the lead was the leader. But I think there was a lot of jealousy there as far as I'm concerned because they had like 500 people in the beginning and he raised it to 25,000, you know, uh, and just people were inspired to join, especially blacks and join the nation of, of, of Islam. Um, he had Muhammad Ali, as you know, was Cassius Clay. He changed his religion. So he had amazing, uh, amazing power. And it was through his speech. And what was great about him was giving black people, black males especially, confidence, having them being proud of themselves. Now, remember, this was the 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 sixties, uh, civil rights movement in the heat of them. He inspired the Black Panthers to start. This is what this man could do in a speech. He was a great orator, and um, as I said. I, I certainly didn't believe in black separatism at that time. What was I, 17 or 18? And um, but the kind of confidence and the kind of uh, energy in, involved in that, he really made uh, black males really feel that they were just as good as anybody else. And nobody did it better than Malcolm. And I think that's what he was great for. Of course, Talk speaking of spiritual, he really went through things because, you know, I'm cutting to the chase to the end. This nation of Islam is 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 responsible for killing him at the end, as when he was murdered, right. and uh, depending on what you believe. And um, so, what he believed in, he he went through a major spiritual journey from um, from being a, a criminal to being in jail, to getting national, uh, uh, becoming a, a Muslim. Uh, and then, of course, uh, finding out that the um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was impregnating his secretaries and um, what dropped that, joined, uh, went to, to Mecca, had another spiritual, and, and realized that people could be, uh, it doesn't matter what color, they could be Muslims. And a lot of things that I thought maybe he was very naive about, he, in the beginning, because he was very much into the nation of Islam, led him into some tragic waters. But it certainly was a spiritual. But he was an amazing person. 
Amazing. Yes, he was. Yeah, uh, yes, he was. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the music first of this opera. Um, Anthony Davis has written an incredible score. It's got all kinds of different influences, and maybe you can explain a little bit to our audience about what they are. Yeah, he um, he he his whole concept. Uh, he was an intellectual. He's very much an academic. Uh, um, he he now is uh, he teaches at the University of California. But I think when he was a kid, his father uh, won a Fulbright, uh, and and he took and and he during his sabbatical, I mean, he took his whole family there, so he was educated in Italy. So I mean, he's quite an academic, and he he wanted to take, but his basic he he everything is in his music, you know, everything from Jew uh, from from jazz to 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 a gospel. Uh, um, uh, Western European classical uh, experimental music, all of that's in uh, X. And uh, to me, I was thinking about it after listening to his music, but I really heard the elements of jazz more than anything. And I says, if there are some people who are not opera goers and they really love jazz, I would think they could, they would be, especially what's going on now with the other modern operas, they would really become opera goers. That's, I think we should go after that crowd because that's what's happening. And you talk about John Adams, uh, 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 the death of Klinghoffer and, and, and Harvey Milk and, and that opera about the, uh, the move, move experience, the people in, in North Philadelphia whose house were, uh, were, were uh, bombed. All of these uh, musicals are about, um, they have that jazz element. They have modern music. It's not the traditional Verdi and Puccini and Rossini. It's, and, and it's, and it's, uh, that's what the, the new opera is bringing to us. And uh, I think, you know, the administration of opera should take care of it because I'm, I'm very concerned about the audience for opera as we go along, but that's what's happening. But yeah, he uses, I hear jazz, you know, I, I don't have that kind of background where I can appreciate all of the, the intricacies, but of all of the other things that he's done, all of the other music that he incorporates, I hear jazz more than anything else. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about perhaps about some of the uh, singers here? Um, I, as you mentioned, a lot of the black singers um, who are associated with the opera, they, you know, they had a discussion with the Met leadership and some of them are now coming to the fore. And um, Will Liverman, I believe, is performing the role of uh, Malcolm. Um, and then uh, Victor Ryan Robertson is playing uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad and also this character called The Street. Leah Hawkins is uh, Louise, uh, Rayhan Bryce Davis. Can you give us... Uh, a, a sort of a background on some of these performers. Well, I, Will Liverman is the up and coming. He 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 did the lead in Fire Shut Up at My Bones, but he's doing some ex amazing things in in Chicago. Also, I think they have. Uh, he just did a kind of hip hop version. Uh, I think last year of the um, the Barber of Seville. And uh, not only is he a fine singer and fine musician, but he's extremely creative. So he got together with a hip hop musician and they put on and, and, and it was a part of the Chicago Lyric Opera season. They put on this uh, Barbara Seville, basically a hip hop version of Barbara Seville. It was unbelievable. So, I mean, he's well liked uh, uh, when you think of of. Of Malcolm X, he well, he, he I don't know how tall he was, but he looked about six feet tall. And of course, the the, the famous film Denzel Washington playing him with the uh, Spike Lee movie is absolutely, you know, if if you really want to know something about Malcolm, you should see that movie. It certainly should have won the Academy Award that year, and it was very controversial even till today. But um, yeah, we'll leave a minutes one. Uh, and the other two, Leah Hawkins, these are up and, and coming uh, 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 Black singers who probably will be at A-list at some time soon. They're working very hard, uh, and uh, uh, but Will Le Liverman, to me, is great. Uh, Tim, you gave me a a, a, a section of uh, Anthony Davis, I think, performing a little um, aria uh, from um, a YouTube recording, and it's uh, um, 
a nice little jazz piece. Uh, I'm going to play that, little sections of that for the listeners, but can you comment okay. about why you chose to give me that particular aria? Well, I, I really love that. As a matter of fact, there's an aria by Malcolm who, who really uh, talks about you know, his feeling and his philosophy to people when he gives it. But what I love, this was a major contrast. And this was during his um, 1940s when he was in Boston. And he was still basically a, a country boy, as it says. And and he lived with, uh, lived with his sister, I think, in Boston. But he then became a part of the street life. Uh, and uh, there was a character by the name of Street, and uh, he hung in the clubs. And uh, when Street uh, saw him, he was uh, he, he did some rap to him. You'll hear some rap on the album, but he was telling him uh, what he need to do, what he need to be, and how he needs to to, to carry himself if he's going to be in this kind of life. And he says, "You need a zoot suit, uh, a conk." which is actually a kind of hairstyle that a lot of the Black entertainers wore around the 1940s and 50s. And it basically was lie and that you put in your hair and then you would shape it. And the whole concept is to make your hair almost look like a white person's hair, which is now really frowned on if anybody <laughs> tries that in the Black community, especially for the men. Um, he says, um, uh, you need to uh, you need to dress night dress nice. Um, he says you you need a little dash, so you have to get some cash. Uh, uh, so you have to, to meet a girl of your dreams. You've got to be clean. So it's very it's it almost it's very jazzy. And I have a recording I think of Thomas Young, who did it years ago when he first did it. I think in 1986. And uh, it shows a lot of the um, style that Anthony Davis uses, but it's pure jazz, pure rap, even at that time. We're talking about 36 years ago. Uh, and um, it's it's amazing piece. I loved it. I loved it. Great. Uh, 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 I'm sure the listeners will enjoy hearing uh, uh, an excerpt from it. Um, I'm going to ask you one final question, Tim. Get a yeah. little, per perhaps a little personal. Um, yeah. You are uh, uh, probably one of the very, very few uh, uh, Black musicians who has run an opera company anywhere in this country, no less run it for 37 years. Um, what does, just to you personally, watching the changes coming about uh, in the world of opera and seeing more Black performers get an opportunity, um, uh, something that you had to create for yourself for so many years, um, what does that mean to you now, as uh, now that you've retired? I loved opera from a teenager, and I, I, Tom, I can't tell you why. I just, it just, I just loved it. I, we had these little free tickets to go to. I, I'm a native of Philadelphia, and I just took advantage of it. There was something like a Discover program. I went, and I mean, uh, I'm sure it was a spectacle. Everything about it, I was hooked, and I was a teenager. And I've stayed with it. It's grown with me. I wanted to be an opera singer. I did some, I did some studying. It didn't happen for me. I didn't win the important auditions at the at certain times in order to have a career, but that's okay. Uh, I did something else, went to plan B, just as long as I was involved in opera. But I because, you know, because of my age, I really am somewhat of a traditionalist. And what I'm seeing as I explained to you earlier, is that, you know, in a sense, my, my, my group, my age group is, is kind of, I'm finding opera is going more towards another kind of genre in order to make it live. And, and I'm concerned about that. And it is going towards jazz. Fire shot up, shut up in my bones. I mean, there's the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, which is probably one of the best orchestras in the world. And there's a combo, jazz combo, <laughs> there in front of it, because that's the way uh, Terrence Blanchard, who's uh, a jazz trumpeter and, and actually responsible for a lot of the music of Spike Lee, has in the front. And, and 
the cues, some of the cues when it comes to the jazzy parts are not given by the conductor, but by the drummer in the combo part. So it's, I really think, and the argument now, especially among us traditionalists is, is it really opera? Is it jazz? And, um, and and the also the modernization of chords, certain chords that you're not we're not used to listening to. If you're listening to Mozart or Gordy <laughs> or Puccini, we have to make this transition if we're going to make it live. And um, I'm the kind of person I love all forms of music. I really do, but I don't know if the uh, audience ears, especially of the people who've been listening to opera all this time can make the tradition. I I do write on a wonderful opera blog and I love it. I don't write on it. I comment it periodically. And it's interesting. These, I, I love it because it's educational. People uh, have been involved with opera as long as I have. And when it comes to fire sh shut up in my bones, you might see 12 comments, you know, mm -hmm. when they do, when they do, um, uh, Rigoletto, there's 500. So, I mean, I, you know, I think that says something and I think we need to open our minds up to to what's what is really happening. And what I'm saying basically is that it's turning into modern. Modern opera is going to take over, period, you know, as as time goes on. Tim, how lovely to talk to you, uh, oh, thanks, thanks. even if it's over Zoom. And, and I've, I've been trying to, you know, I, I get you on this podcast now, I think, for about six months. And Oh, great. You know, well, so I didn't, you know, I thought we were having a conversation. That's there you go. About. See, <laughs> that's what I loved about it. That's know. what I loved about it too. And and I know yeah. we have a lot of live at the Met that comes up, and we've have some more traditional operas to talk about in the future. So maybe you'll come back and talk to me about those. Right. Just let me anything for you, Tom. Okay, thanks, right. Tim. I appreciate okay. your time. Thank you. We're not asking Massa to sit at a lunch counter. We want. Self-determination. We want to get our people off of dope, off alcohol, off the welfare rolls. We must rebuild the black family and our community, ravaged by despair. We need to look to our brothers in Africa, taking back their plundered countries, telling Massa what time it is. We need work, we need jobs, and we need to create them. Because we know if whites are forced, to give us their jobs, there'll be war. Bloody, bloody, bloody war. A bloody race war. <laughs> we want freedom, justice, equality. Don't expect anybody to give our people freedom. We want to stand up against the racism. All black people. Together. X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, will be presented at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Saturday, November 18th, 2023, at 1 p.m. Tickets are $20 for adults, $18 for members, and $10 for students. Listeners are advised that this opera contains strong language and has a running time of 3 hours and 42 minutes with two intermissions. Live at the Met is underwritten with support from Daniel S. Kaufman and Timothy W. Beaver. And that's it for this veterans edition of Notes from the Isle Seat. My thanks to Todd Langworthy, Kathy Fink, and Tim Kennedy for being my guests on this episode. Notes from the Isle Seat is a production of the 1891 Fredonia Opera House in Fredonia, New York. For more information on any of the Opera House's events, call the box office at 716-679-1891, visit the website at www.fredopera.org, or email at operahouse at fredopera.org. Notes from the Isle Seat is now available wherever you get your podcasts and also on the Opera House YouTube channel. If you like this podcast, please consider following us by clicking the follow button on our home website at isleseat.podbean.com 
and spreading the word through your social media feeds. If you have an arts event you'd like featured on the podcast, why don't you drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org and we'll be glad to see about featuring your event. Please try to give us a month's advance notice if possible to facilitate timely scheduling. If you have any suggestions, comments, or criticisms of the podcast, just drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org. We'll be glad to receive your feedback. Our next episode will be available on Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023. I'm Tom Laughlin, and until then, be safe out there, and be kind to one another. <laughs>